Uh, this first week back, we're going to talk about what as does a messianic kahila look like in today's culture. So I thought um, it was important to touch on that because a couple of people have asked us, a couple of people said, people have asked us, what are you, what are you, what, a synagogue, Jewish or what? So I think it's important for us to understand where we fit into the scheme of things and what our emphasis is as messianic believers. Uh, so that's where we'll be today. It's, it'll be a little bit different. I'll try and we were going to do a bit more of a round table uh, with Daniel, Ryan and myself, but uh, Daniel's stuck at home, unfortunately. Um, so, so Daniel will be sharing from home um, and Ryan and I will be sharing from here. And it's, we, we've got a lot here, so we're going to try and condense it and we might even carry over to another time. Uh, we've, we've got a lot of background material, but I, what I really want to do is have some discussion as well because that's what a Beit Midrash is all about. So next week, and it just depends on how much we get done this week, we might carry it over to next week and then start uh, the book of Revelation uh, the following week. So we're flexible, aren't we? We can be flexible? Good. So Marie shared last, at the end of last year that this year's theme would be unity, Echad. Uh, this being a compound unity, not a singular unity, which means it's okay for all of us to be at different stages in this journey, right? Which we are, and it's okay. We can still be a unity, even though there are differences in what we do, how we do it, when we do it, because we're still learning. That's part of the process, part of the journey. But we have one purpose, one goal, one vision in mind is to get there. And what does there look like? Well, we'll describe that a little bit later on. Some of the things that Rabbi Shapiro was saying was part of the there. We want to make sure that we are a community that represents who the true Messiah is. That's probably number one goal. Number two goal is... We want to represent a community where Messiah can come and say, I can be king. We want to crown him as king. That's our responsibility. He is king, but we need to do our part to do that. So that's the sort of down the distance. And look, we're all, we're all on that journey in our own personal lives. We're all in that journey as a community together, and we're going to get there. That's, that's what this is about. So we're going to have some discussions around that. But it, there was an interesting passage both in our um, Torah reading to this uh, week, this Shabbat, as well as in our Besorah reading. And I want to read to you from Luke chapter 11, and I think verse 17, he says, so this is where he was, Yeshua was casting out demons uh, from people and the Pharisees, the scribes came along and said, you know, what, what are you doing? How are you doing this? You're, you know, prince of the demons, aren't you, by casting them out? And um, Yeshua's response was, he knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be destroyed and house will fall against house. Even the Satan, if he is divided against himself, how then will his kingdom remain firm? But you say that by Baal I drive out demons. But if I drive out demons by Baal by whom do your sons drive them out? Because the Pharisees did drive out demons as well. That was, that's one of the things we'll touch on a little bit later on. They did do signs and wonders. Therefore, they will be your judge. But if the finger of God, if, sorry, if by the finger of God I drive out the demons, then the kingdom of God has arrived to you. Interesting. Yeshua is actually accused of casting out demons by Baal Zaval. 
also known as the dung god. That's another name for um, Baal Zaval or Hasatan, as we also know him. Sorry? Beelzebub is another English version of it, yes. <laughs> So Yeshua's response was, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined with one house collapsing on another. Without that unity, the house will collapse. So it goes with the Kahila. We need that unity. And one thing we can sure about with what's happening around the world at the moment with COVID-19, with America, with Australia's position with China. There's a lot of pressure on believers to be focused on so many other things that we can forget about working together in unity, towards unity. And that was what Rabbi Shapiro was also saying with regards to the, the vaccine. He's not against, he's not for the vaccine. He's not saying it's bad, he's not saying it's good. He's saying if that becomes the focus, if our conspiracies theories become the focus. If American politics becomes the focus, we've lost what we're about. We've lost Yeshua. We've lost the Messiah. So we need to continue that focus in everything we do. Otherwise, we become divided. But the interesting thing Yeshua said, if he said, if by the finger of God, I cast out the demons, then the kingdom of God has come, right? That expression is only used two other times in Scripture, in Exodus, actually. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> once in this week's reading, once, one more time, when we see that Hashem inscribes the words of Torah onto the tablets of stone. By the finger of God, they are inscribed onto the tablets of stone. It represents the power of Hashem when it comes to driving out demons. But it also represents the, the fingerprint of Hashem when it comes to writing on the Torah. And where is Hashem going to write the Torah eventually? In Jeremiah, on our hearts, by the finger of God, with his fingerprint. So, what is a fingerprint all about? It's how you, identity. identity, exactly. It's how you can identify someone. And what is the identity that Yeshua said to his Talmudim in Yohanan 13.35? He said, by this shall all men know that you are my Talmudim, by your love for one another. That is the fingerprint of Hashem on a Messianic community. Now, we're going to unpack that a bit. <laughs> That was the easy answer. How does that look? Yeah, yeah. Ryan, have you got the... Mary's got the microphone. <laughs> Someone's got the microphone. Sorry. Is, is that got anything to do with the seal that's spoken of in Revelation? The seal? The seal on those believers. Is that any kind of... The, the seal is there any of relation the, or no? The seal of the Ruach is probably more a... Um, uh, guarantee of redemption. Uh, and I think it's also a guarantee of redemption and the down payment of the promises of the New Testament, the New Covenant from yep. Jeremiah in the life of a believer, if that so, makes sense. So, that's come before, that when, yep. when Yeshua... That's, that's yeah. what separates, that's what the whole Holy Spirit dynamic is, is that it gives you that down payment before anyone else and everyone will catch up to us and then we'll teach them and 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 that down payment that seal is the one who enables us to live the life that he wants us to live yeah. we need that seal to be able to do that yes with the right spirit hey, wait, on. <laughs> wait in line who else was there oh, oh sorry and i just want to add also it's a seal of prevention it's a seal of protection we are we are totally protected. We we are in the ark when the the, the ruach come upon their lives. Yeah. Was there someone else? No. no, good. So, what does a messianic kahila look like then? 
or what does Messianic Judaism look like? Same sort of question. How does that compare to the other Judaisms around in our current time? How does that fit in with Christianity? Um, well, in 2019, at uh, the Yeshiva AGM, Rabbi Shapira shared this with us, and it goes pretty much in line with what he was sharing before. Uh, he, he said it slightly differently, but he said this about Yeshiva Shavu and all the Kahilas that uh, come under that umbrella, under that guidance, which is us. He said this, we will not put down Christianity because of doctrines and misunderstandings they have about the Bible and its application. So I'm paraphrasing a little bit because I can't remember the quote exactly. He says, we will not be so far right of Messianic Judaism that we become orthodox. He says, in reality, Messianic Judaism, we are more, sorry, as Messianic Judaism, we are more conservative than orthodox. Now, I'm going to try and explain those terms so that we know what that actually means. And we will work with, Christ, with the Christian church to bring the Jewish Messiah back to Judaism. Mm. So he stayed true to what he said two years ago in what he shared today, okay? That's always been his heart and it will continue to be his heart and it will continue to be our heart. And we have sometimes strayed a little bit from that. We have, I know I've put Christianity down and that's, you know, I apologize for that. That's not the right thing. We need to try and keep our speech to the point where we don't put them down for being different, but we try and identify the differences and then try and bring Messiah Yeshua out from them. So, and bring the remnant that want to be part of that with them as well. There'll always be some that will just say, no, I want what I've got and I'm happy with it. And there'll be some that are open hearted, open minded and say, hang on, there's something there. I want to know more. So they're the people that we need to be open to and share the good news of Messiah with them. Because we're not putting down Christians. It's no. the system no. that we're, that's the yeah. issue. We, we, we can't put down Christians because as we know, you only know what you've been taught. Okay. <laughs> and most of us has come from that point where we've been taught something and we, that's all we know. But until you're taught something else and you're open to it and you go, oh, hang on, there's something in that. I'm going to study more. I'm going to search more. I'm going to search God. And then you start to understand yeah. this is why we're all here and we're all on that journey. Particularly what you're saying is like our language versus criticizing the system versus the individual believer. Because like myself, back in the day, I had my identity attached to the wording. So I think we're just picking more our wording so as to not to attack someone's identity, but to highlight an overall system, much like Yeshua and the Pharisees. He wasn't against Pharisaism, but he was against certain ideas within Pharisaic circles. And that's like kind of, it's a difficult paradigm to achieve. Oh, I, I had a thought. Uh, it, it's not that we, uh, that we are against Christianity. It's that I found that since I have walked in the way of the messianic way, uh, I have never uh, had so much opposition. But by the very same token, every single person that the Hashem has led me to speak or they have come to me for information, their heart are totally open. The, the field are ripe. The people that the, the Hashem has brought to me, they are, they are so ripe to listen to this, this, this new Besora that they've never, never heard. I was just going to say that one day I asked the lady, why in my whole house, just me, like in my father's house, just me, are seeking Torah, are looking for understanding and learning? And she said, no, and I said, why only me uh, learning Torah? She said, because you were the one seeking. And then I remember the verse in the Bible that said, you seek me and you'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart. So. All right. So look, I don't want to put labels on myself or ourselves and say, this is, you know, we are labeled this. 
but I think it's important to understand where we fit into the scheme of things because we are representing Messianic Judaism. So there is a label to us to a degree. Um, it's a responsibility to make sure that we represent that correctly. Would it be said that we're repairers of the breach yes. and the separation That's between nice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Israel Very good. That's a, it's a good way to look at it. We're repairing and we're reconstructing something from these diet yep. bones of orthodoxy. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, so I, I'm going to start with a couple of uh, types of Judaism that are around today. And the problem is there's a lot of them around as well, but they probably don't differ as much as Christianity in terms of their doctrines. Um, so there's probably three main sects of Judaism. Judith. Sorry. David and Lisa. Oh, David, yes. Oh, I was just, just going to say, um, or Lisa mentioned to me before about, uh, you mentioned that Rabbi Shapira had said, um, probably more closer or in line with conservative Judaism. So it'd be interesting to understand uh, maybe because that could be taken um, a few different ways. And, and I think it'd be good to understand what Rabbi Shapira and, and maybe for everyone to understand how that um, aligns with, with, with our key of our. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, I think that's what we're trying to establish. Uh, ho hopefully we can come up with an answer that works for us. <laughs> so Orthodox Judaism is defined by um, strict adherence to traditional understanding of Jewish law as interpreted by rabbinic authorities over the centuries. So hallmarks of Orthodox religious life include strict observance on Shabbat, no driving, no working, no turning on electricity, no handling of money, and of kosher law. So they're the main uh, sort of topics of strictness, but there's a whole bunch of other uh, things that go with it as well. Basically keeping all the mitzvah and how they're meant to be kept in a very strict sense. But within Orthodox Judaism, there is also modern Orthodox, Haredi Orthodox, which is like the ultra Orthodox. So they're stricter than strict. And modern's probably a little bit more loose. Modern's uh, probably more like um, conservative. It's con more synonymous with conservative. Yeah, yeah. yeah. More, more heading towards our direction. And there's one called Hasidic Judaism, which we'll talk a little bit more about later on because that, that has a varied history, uh, but it's very applicable to us as Messianics. Then we have what's called Reform Judaism. You're right. CC, far away. You go ahead, Ralph. I was going to ask about Reform Judaism and you're about to tell me. Right, yep. Very Thank good. So I'm, I'm talking about the, the three main ones that a lot of the others come underneath. There, there are a lot of smaller sub-branches as well, but Orthodox, Reform and Conservative are the main ones. And then uh, we'll also talk about Hasidic Judaism, which is sort of, it's a branch of Orthodox, but it's a slightly different branch and it's sort of roughly where we sit in that space. So, so Reform Judaism is uh, probably the largest affiliation of American Jews, roughly 35% of them are Reformed. The movement emphasizes the primary, uh, the primacy of the Jewish e ethical tradition over the obligations of Jewish law. So it very much says, you know, this is Jewish law says this is how you should do this. But they may say, well, we're not quite going to do it that way, because we're only interested in the ethics of it. So we might not even do half the things. Uh, we, as long as we have an ethical position behind what we're doing, which is which is not a bad position. It's not, you know, I, I'm not going to put it down. But it, that's not where we're heading as a Kahila. The movement has traditionally sought to adopt Jewish tradition to modern sensibilities and sees itself as politically progressive and socially justice orientated while emphasizing personal choices in matters of ritual observance. So th 
they've basically gone to the um, extreme or to, you know, to the looseness of freedom or liberal understanding of um, we have homosexual um, rabbis, uh, women rabbis and things like that. So they, they've taken that, well, this is the modern society we live in and we're just going to adapt our Judaism to that. Not saying it's good or bad, I'm just saying that's where they've gone. Conservative Judaism is sort of in the middle of those two. It's um, also known as uh, Mazorti or traditional Judaism, and it sees Jewish law as obligatory, though in practice there is an enormous range of observance amongst conservative Jews. So sort of heading towards a little bit what David was referring to, conservative Judaism has a range within it still. So where do we fit into that, that range? <clears throat> the movement has historically represented a midpoint on the spectrum of observance between orthodox and reform, adopting certain innovations like driving, on, uh, driving to synagogue on Shabbat, but nowhere else on Shabbat, uh, gender egalitarian, egalitarian prayer, which means my understanding is that women would be considered to be part of a minion. A am I correct in that? Does anybody know the, if that's um, right, that position? S sorry, say again. Uh so uh, gender egalitarian prayer, which means yes. women are considered to be part of a minion when yep. it comes to uh, 10 righteous people rather than 10 righteous men. Yeah, that probably has its own scope, but that would be what a area in that, which is yeah. similar to what we Yeah, see. okay, yeah. So, Judith? Okay, so, so a minion is 10 righteous people that are required. Well, in Orthodox Judaism, it would be 10 righteous men required to do a full Amidah prayer service. And that comes from when Abraham was interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah. And he was bringing Hashem down to, what about if there's 50 righteous men? What about if there's 20? What about if there's 10? And that's where he stopped. And Hashem said, even if there was 10 righteous men there, I would not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And so Judaism has picked that and said, that is the minimum group of righteous men required to do the Amidah prayer as a corporate, right? You can do the Amidah prayer individually, but a proper official corporate prayer, you need 10 righteous men, right? Were you gonna say something? No. Can I ask a question, Rev? I'm oh, sorry. Oh, um, sorry. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Me or Chris? Chris. Oh, hello. Um, I was just going to say that um, I studied at the conservative yeshiva in Israel a few wow. years ago. And um, yeah, they're very egalitarian in terms of uh, Torah study as well. So at the yeshiva, it was a husband and wife couple that was um, studying together every day. I would see that it was interesting. But um, their view is also that women would be counted in a minion and also they were allowed to be rabbis. Right. Okay. Good. Thank, thanks for that, uh, Chris. So, so conservative is the women are included as a righteous person. And that's the practice that we have adopted in our Kahila. So if we have 10 righteous people, because through Yeshua, we've all been made righteous, uh, we consider that to be a minion. Oh, yeah, sorry, Gigi. Yeah, no, I was going to ask, Ralph, when you say a minion uh, for the, I know, like, you have the 10 righteous men, the minion, the female minion would be 10 female righteous women or them, or the women counted together with the men to have the... Together the with the order. I, Together. I, I would still expect a man to be at least leading the, the prayer service. The counting. Yeah, to be... Counting. The ratio. Yeah. Thank you. We have so many people that we have not enough people to lead prayer and we have 10 men and 10 women to pray separately. I'm sure a woman can lead it 
yeah. one day maybe we will have so many people that we have to confront this issue. But yeah. <laughs> that would only be a, a good thing to have. That's right. So basically, uh, conservative Judaism affirms that the halakhic process reflects the divine will. Uh, it makes use of the concept of Kalal Israel, the whole of Israel or the whole of the Jewish community in the decision of Jewish law, uh, uh, are largely determined by the practices of that um, Kalal Israel, of the Jewish, of the community of Judaism. So in conservative Judaism, there is a central halakhic authority. Uh, it's called the Committee of Jewish Law and Standards. They will set um, positions on what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, but those positions could be two or three different positions. And then it's up to each kahila, the rabbi of each kahila, to determine whether they'll follow that position or not, make their own position. So there is a governing body, but the individual kahila and the rabbi are still autonomous enough to be able to say, no, we're not going to follow that. We will make our own halaha in that area, our own way of expressing that. Excuse me, Ralph. Is that minhad? Is that what they call minhad? Or different again? Uh, did I say minha? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you. If that way, when they decide I'm going to follow this or that, would it be the same thing or not? I, I, I don't know. Um, okay. More like a uh, tradition, uh, as in like, um, we have two flags in our kahila, but not ah, every kahila right, yes. has flags. Or or the way we do our arc with all the options, that I think is more like that, whereas halakha is like, what is the actual way of walking this out for every Jewish member of this community? Yeah. 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 How do we do it together? How do we fulfill it? Yeah. Thank you. You're right. They're more like traditions. Yeah. Yeah. David? Um, I've just got a question because to help me picture, yeah. on 60 Minutes not long ago, uh -huh. there was a full show on um, Hasidic. Were they Orthodox or does someone know who they were? On, yeah, on 60 Minutes, so, somebody in Melbourne, they had a full community on TV showing the Messianic or, or the Judaism yeah. movement. I don't know, just to help me picture who they are. My Ben Chabad. Does anyone know who they are? And yeah, and, and oh, that can, that can, that, they were very that, strict. Yeah. Were they wearing furry hats or flat hats or? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, so that, that's the Hasidic ultra orthodox. So it's, Baseline is orthodoxy, but then it has outgrowths of things like Hasidism, which will unpack and other ideas within that. Yeah, so well, well I, it's a good question. We'll unpack that. So you don't have to wear a furry hat, just a hat. <laughs> um, all right, sorry, where was I up to? Conservative Judaism believes that uh, scholarly study of Jewish text indicates that uh, Judaism has constantly been evolving to meet the needs of the Jewish people in varying circumstances, and that a central halakhic authority can continue the halakhic evolution. In other words, we're not stuck with the laws that were set down 3,000 years ago by the rabbis because our culture has changed, and sometimes those laws have to change and be adaptable. For example, electricity was one. Or the internet. Once or the use of it. Once electricity was invented, right, there had to be a law made about do we actually switch on the lights on Shabbat because that in the orthodox, in the orthodox system is classed as work. So the orthodox Jew would not turn a light switch on on Shabbat. You would have timers in your house that would turn lights on and off when you need them. The lifts in Jerusalem, uh, in Israel, they would be automatically set for every floor, so you don't have to push the button to say which floor you're on. So if you want to get to the top floor, you've got to go to every floor on that lift and then back down again. So those would be classed as work in... Uh, so what I'm saying is those were new laws that were put in place 
to manage living in modern culture. And that's what conservative Judaism also believes, except they've said probably it might be okay to switch on electricity on Shabbat because it may not fall under that classification yeah. of work. So I think it depends like the idea of lighting a fire is the same as creating light with a light switch. So it depends how you're going to implement that halakhic concept yeah. with electricity. Yeah, exactly. So David, did you have, I thought you were, I thought you were lining up for a question there, David. Sorry. <laughs> no. Conservative Judaism. So I'm, I'm spending a bit more time on conservative Judaism because Rabbi Shapiro says we are more like conservative. We're not conservative Judaism, okay? We're Messianic. But as Messianics, we'll look a little bit more like conservative than some of the others. Conservative Judaism does not, sorry, does hold that the laws of the Torah and the Talmud are of divine origin and thus mandate the following of halakhic Jewish law. At the same time, conservative movement recognizes the human element in the Torah and the Talmud and accepts modern scholarship that shows that Jewish writings also show the influence of other cultures and in general can be treated as historical documents as well. Conservative Judaism affirms the legitimacy of scientific biblical criticism, which means you're allowed to challenge what the rabbis say because the rabbis themselves challenge what the rabbis say. Yep. So we can do that. We can look at it and go, this rabbi says this, this rabbi says that. So which one are we going to understand? We don't have to go, uh, the Ramban actually says this, and we have to do exactly what he says because he is right, because someone else will challenge what he says. Rashi, no, I won't go into Rashi, but we'll talk about him some other time. The movement believes that God is, is real and that God, God's will is made known to humanity through revelation. The revelation at Sinai was the clearest and most public of such divine revelations, but revelation also took place with other people called prophets. And according to some, in more, moder in more subtle form, can happen even today. So conservative Judaism says God can still talk to us through us as not prophets, but as someone who has a gift of prophecy someone who has an understanding of the heart and the voice of Hashem and can share that with others. Does that make it the same as a prophet in the Torah? No. In the Tanakh, I should say. Nowhere near it. But we can still listen to it and take counsel, especially if it's given in an environment where others are listening and judging that, especially people from leadership. And we, we've talked about uh, the gift of the spirit before, especially prophecy. If someone grabs you, takes you to the corner and says, I've got a prophetic word for you and there's no witnesses, just say, oh, excuse me, can I just grab one of the Shamashim or someone else to come and stand by and listen to the prophecy that you're giving me? Because that's a little bit dodgy when someone does that sort of stuff. We, we don't want to do that sort of thing. If you're going to give someone a prophetic word of encouragement and all that, great, do it. But do it amongst the crowd, you know, some other people. Not to show off, but so that you have a witness and that can be judged, like the Torah says, or like um, Rav Shul says in the Apostolic Writings, he said, you know, let the other prophets be witnesses. Yep. When it says prophets, it's talking about people who have the gift of prophecy. So let them be witnesses to that prophetic word. Exactly. And judge it, yeah. So Hasidic Judaism, which I'm going to let Ryan talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, Yeah, look, I, I might I might stop there. Ryan, what I might what I think we might do is talk a bit more about Hasidic Judaism, um, its history and what it looks like now. And then we'll talk about how do we fit into that circle. So come on forward. Do you have your thing or do you want me to it's all it's all here if you want to put it there and that's fine. Yeah. Because you won't have the yeah. uh, platform. I'm not gonna talk about prophecy and stuff. The Sadducees and Pharisees are important uh, I'll, I'll cover for us. I'll cover a little bit anyway. Yeah. Is that, is that, is that, is that, is that, oh. Just, yeah, we'll bring this one over.
I might not. I'm, they're just there just in case. I'm not going <laughs> to. It'll be a very short study. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, no, it's, it, it, we're going to stay later if that's okay, but this is important because, I mean, if, if you really want to be serious, that's, that's what I'm. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, like, well, what else do you have to do on Shabbat, right? You know, but you know, the internet's off at home, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> okay. And then, yes. Yeah. So I'll, I'll go through. So when we think of Hasidism, we automatically think of the people that David was talking about. You've got the long curls, the black coat, speaks Yiddish, talks like this, lives in New York, <laughs> that kind of thing. That's what you think of. But that is a, um, a definition in a group who has taken the concept, which this word I'll break down, it's the, the topic word of the day, Hasidism or being a Hasid and made it their own brand. And that brand has been so influential that other Jewish people have gone, I like what they've got. I'm going to take some of that, buy some of that branding and apply it to my thing because it's so good. And there's a reason why it's so good. Um, but we're going to look at this word and where it comes from and how it applies to the gospel and then to us because we should be living in a gospel realm or taking yeah. a lot of ideas from that, which obviously takes his ideas from the Talmud and is a very, as Rabbi Shapira said, Pharisaic concepts in the New Testament. All right. So a Hasid or the Hasidic sect was a group of pious Jews who associated with the Pharisees and the sages. So we're talking around Yeshua's time now. So if you said a Hasidic Jew back then, mm. he would have gone to what we're about to speak now in his mind. So they held to the belief that matters of ethics and morality were of greater importance than issues of purity and halakha. But that didn't mean they're not reformed Jews in that they said, well, we're not going to practice them then. They just said that your halakhic practice, let's say you're very strict with how you tithe, must mean that you are morally stricter than your ability to tithe. So if you're very meticulous about not mixing milk and meat, then they would say, well, you better be as meticulous about always being truthful and not yeah. being lustful and not hating your brother. You must be even more clean than the dish that you've just purified. Yeah. That, that is the standard. They're saying your moral purity has yeah. to stand on the shoulders of your uh, ritual purity because the two are actually related. And that's a very gospel idea, mm -hmm. which we will probably not unpack today, but it's important for us. Um, so their focus was on the inner purity rather than just purely outer purity. So, that, so it's not just like the look that you're doing good deeds, but you have to have good deeds. You can't just say, well, I'm all about ritual purity, but they'd be like, where are your works at? Where are your good deeds at? Where is your love at? You know, And this is the issue that Yeshua has with some of the Pharisees. Hmm. So, or rather some of the Pharisees had with Yeshua, the, their issue <laughs> yeah. with him, right? Um, so in Matthew 6, 5, you know, we see when you pray, don't pray like the hypocrites who love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners so that people can see them. Yes, I tell you, they have their reward already. So a Hasidic person doesn't make a public display of their purity or piety. They're very humble, very lowly people. They're not proud. They're not self-righteous, mm. which is, which can become trying to be Hasidic you have to be careful because you can become like those Pharisees or oh, look how good I am look at this I do that this is being a Hasid is the opposite it's taking those concepts but making them purely about your relationship with God um, they use particular gospel language see you guys um, so they would refer to God as their father and they some of them believe to have a father-son relationship with God this blew my mind when I read this book here I really recommend you read it the Sage from Galilee, Rediscovering Jesus' Genius by David Flusser. That blew my mind. I always thought that that was a purely growing up in a Pentecostal house. I was like, no, no one else has this relationship. But I found that other Jews were saying that I have a father in heaven. He's my father. And when I speak to him, I am like his son. And he listens to what I say because he's my dad. That, yeah. that is essentially the relationship they had. And other Jews would look to them. And they would say, hey, pray for rain because we know that you are closer to God than anyone here, that he'll listen to your request and not mine because you're so buddy-buddy with God. You're so father and son with God. Um, it's important for us to think about because that's a very Yeshua idea. You know, I will make you sons of God. I'll teach you to be sons of God. That's a Hasidic principle for us. Can, can I just, sorry. Yes. I just, I just had a, a, a thought. Through your... 
Yeah, yeah. Um, just a little thought there. And, and this is where we differ with Christianity. Christianity um, has the concept of, I want to get close to Yeshua. I, he's like, I'm buddy-buddy with Yeshua, right? But at the end of the day, Yeshua says, glorify the Father. I glor Everything I do glorifies the Father. Mm. For us, we are children, sons and daughters of Hashem. Mm. For us, we want to get close to Hashem. And what Yeshua has done, he's made that path available. He's, he's the ladder that we can go up to Hashem through and get closer to him. He became the mediator, mm. the one that brought us together. So um, I remember in, in Christianity, there was a lot of focus on my relationship with Jesus. You know, it was all about Jesus and the father was there as well, but it was mostly about Jesus. And that's the one that the main thing I think that distinguishes us between Christianity and Judaism. Our whole goal is to get closer to the father. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, um, but I've always thought that Jesus was God. Um, I've always, you know, yeah. the Father and the Son. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. definitely. So, how does that work? It kind okay. of works yeah. well. How, yeah. Do you want to go? <laughs> you go. Well, it kind of works like if, let's say, I look at Amy's mannerisms and I, I, I look at her and I'm like, she reminds me of someone. It's almost as if that person were right here, I was leaning David. It's the same idea as that he condenses the attributes of God in a human form, but obviously God is not a human being. So he is very much God, but at the same time, he can't fully be God because if he were to touch down on earth as God, you'd have to change the whole environment for him to survive in this or for us mm. to survive in him meeting our planet. You know, you know what I mean? So he, so he is God. He, he is a manifestation of God. But he can't embody the fullness of god because god mm. is outside of time he's like a a light particle he's you know what i mean like he becomes that good manifestation for us to see but he can't fully embody god 100 percent. it's a physical impossibility i i think let's look at i don't want to say the word trinity but let's uh -huh. look at god um and like you would say the different manifestation of god yep. um I know that people have no issues with the differentiation between God and the Holy Spirit. Sure. But then there's an issue between God and Jesus. Yep. And the reason is because of the way that we've elevated Jesus yep. as God. And he is God. Let's yep. not forget. He is God. But let's also not forget about the creator of the universe, mm. God, the Father. Mm -hmm. So, and that Jesus' sole purpose was to reconcile us back to the father so yeah. in essence by by um reducing god to only jesus is what we're sort of saying yeah. right now yeah. is we are forgetting the outside of time outside the cosmos outside of space god that exists that cannot exist fully in fullness as jesus mm -hmm. on earth he yep. is not only that. So, yep. and we're not saying that he is not God, that Jesus is not God. No. We're saying that um, Jesus is God, but he cannot be the sole focus as if his purpose was not to connect us back to the Father. So as much as in our minds when we're praying to Jesus, although the Bible doesn't say to pray to Jesus, in our minds when we're doing that, we, in our hearts, we, our heart is, I'm praying to God. But praying in the merit of and praying to is very different. Yeah. We said to pray in the merit of Jesus, okay. not to Jesus. So mm -hmm. it's it's a matter of language, I think. And, and concept. Yeah. Heart-wise, we know we are praying to God. We know God, Jesus is God. Mm -hmm. Our heart, we're not saying our heart is not in the right place or that we are sinning. Mm -hmm. We're saying that let's get the picture right, that yep. we are this relationship correct. God, Jesus, God sent God, uh, Jesus, God sent God mm -hmm. <laughs> to reconcile us back to a state with the father to, yep. to allow us to be able to trans transcend to the state where we can have a relationship with the father. Yep. So, as sons. As sons. Yes. Yeah. I think Amy so first or just, yeah. just quickly clarify. You, you, I've opened a good can of worms, you, haven't I? You, you <laughs> cannot fully, you you cannot fully embrace your relationship with God through Yeshua. If, you, if I want a relationship with Jesus' family, I can't embrace it just through her. Even though they come from the same DNA, they're very similar. I have to get to know those individual members. But I become closer to the family through the merit of marrying Judith. 
and I can see and learn about her family. I can see them embodied in her, but it's the doorway to the father. No one comes to the father. I can't come to her father now unless I go with her to her house. Do you kind of get the concept? Said, yeah. No one comes to the father except for me. Yeah, but in order to it's do that, he has to have a spark of God in him, but he can't embrace the absolute fullness of God. It's just, it's going to take us a while to get our minds around that, but he's not the be all and end all of God. He is that ladder. We have, yes, we have more of, of this. I think yeah. it would be good to, yeah, particularly yeah, on the nature of God. Yeah. So, so, Amy. Sorry, I don't know if this is sidetracking it a little bit. No, that's that fine. Notion of um, reconciliation. <laughs> I'm not used to talking in the mic, it feels a bit <laughs> weird. Um, so, on that notion of reconciliation with Yeshua coming, and I guess the slight difference between how I guess I view God, even though they, to me are the same person it's just person entity whatever you want to call it um it was because if i got this correct yeshua coming here for reconciliation was because of the issue of cleanliness as well like if we're looking at the embodiment of yeshua and the difference between god and yeshua it was to do with cleanliness is that kind of Making sense. I'm not. Really when you mean like that. cleanliness, you mean like uh, moral purity yeah, or the, like inner on purity. our part, on humans' yes, part. So that's, that's right. partly to do with, I guess, in a way, how I. Yeah, yeah. I'm going back to the, uh, that sense totally. of praying in the merit of. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm a bit nervous. No, but, that's yeah. fine. I, I think I think I get what you're saying, and what you're trying to say is he comes and he's so pure and holy that he sets the example of being in him and by connecting to him, we can then meet God because he gives us that ability in his divine purity, but cannot embrace all of God. He takes us to that fullness of God. Mm -hmm. Is it, is that kind of, were you, right, cool. Thank you. Thank you for speaking up. All right. And, and then we'll move to topics. Add, before I think we Rabbi says it. He says, Yeshua is the vehicle, mm. not the end goal. Mm -hmm. And so I think and maybe this analogy work i don't know but worshiping yeshua is like worshiping the finger of god yeah yeah just his yeah. finger yeah you know and you're not worship yeah 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 it's not, the, not fullness the fullness of, fullness of it yeah. yeah so sorry i brought that up but it, it I'm, we're trying to distinguish who we are and representing the true messiah in this mm. kahila is part of that distinction. yes so so while we line up with hasidic judaism in terms of they have a father-son relationship. Um, I just wanted to write on that. So mm. back yeah. to and you, in no shape or form are we diminishing Yeshua to not just a human form or not God no, or not we're, relevant. Um, we're just we're making actually, sure that we do the distinction. So we have Gigi online and then we have... We're Nathan. actually fulfilling Jesus to use God's, his own words. Yeah. Sorry, Gigi first online. And Go then. Gigi. And then um, it was interesting because today I was doing one of the lessons and I'm retaking my studies, but anyway, it was explaining that um, when the letters were having a talk with Hashem, let me be the one that is going to open the word of God and by, by that letter, everything will be created, blah, blah, blah. So we have, in end of story, we have letter Bet starting mm -hmm. Bereshit and the last one being Tav. So, Rabbi Shapiro was explaining that the, the letter bet or the word bet comes from the word bina. And that meaning um, bet ya, bina, bet ya, the son of God, mm -hmm. who is Yeshua. So Yeshua is in the first letter of the word of God, as in bet ya, bina. And then we have the last letter, which is tav. In, in the alphabet, and the meaning of Tav is cross. So in the opening of the word of God, we have the son of God. And in the closing, in the last letter of the alphabet, we have the Tav, that means cross. So we, yep. everything was created through him, by him. Yep. And he is that mediator. So I thought it was fantastic to yeah. have this understanding. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, go Mason. Absolutely. Um, I find I'm just reading through uh, John 15 has a lot of clarification around growing in Jesus as well. And actually um, where our position may stand that's um, yeah, he does say that I'm the true vine and my mm. father is the vine dresser. 
Mm -hmm. So for us to be planted um, in God, it is, um, it's not out of our authority, but out of Jesus' authority. That's why we grow onto him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, absolutely. And he dresses us. So that's why it's important for us to be discipled underneath what he's saying yeah. absolutely yeah, that's good thank I mean, you and that's a, that's like almost the crux of what we're saying like it's a very hasidic passage that we need the two like we we have to have yeshua to be attached to god he's the, the glue that keeps us there yeah. and it's something that we will god willing unpack today or i think we'll have to have more sessions on this because yeah. it's very mm. fundamentally uh it's very formative to who we are Okay, so they were known for their mystical ideas, as in in the beginning was the word and the word was God. It's not based on the Christian church as we know it. And we think of John as a, per se, like a Baptist Christian, John the Baptist. He's actually part of that mystical idea. It was what we call Kabbalah, which just means to receive from God. So if you've ever received anything from God, like the Basor, according to 19, is a Kabbalistic revelation because he, he uh, Rabbi Shapiro received something from God. So we, we're all used to it. We just don't see this as mystical because we grew up with it. It's not a mystical mystery, but I assure you that this is a very mystical Kabbalistic book mm. beyond what we could even identify as Kabbalah. So Especially Revelation. Particularly Revelation. And John, when he works those things, we're just used to hearing it, but that is Jewish mysticism. And it's a hallmark of what being Hasidic is. So we're in good hands because we've grown up with it and we're used to it. So it's not a dirty word. We're going to make it, we're going to grow into it the right way. Yep. Yes. So, um, so these Hasidic guys were used by the sages to be an example of what a good Jew should be. So they'd be like, I, I need to see someone who's really a good person. Let's say, look at Honey the Circle Drawer. Look at his moral example. So they would be pointed out in the Talmud as characters of extreme character and high standards and the person you should aim to be. They weren't necessarily part of the developing halakha, part of those discussions. They were around who can I act my life based upon, a, yep. a person that I can follow, an example I can see to be good. Those are the guys you look to. You look to the, Hasid, the Hasidim and you say, ah, oh, there's a good guy. Yep. There's a pure person. So they were criticized by the sages. And these are particularly the guys that come from the Galilean region. So this is really important when they say, can good come from the Galil? Or, you know, there's Galileans are stupid. That is what we call an inflammatory statement. This is fundamental for you to unlock. It sounds really basic. But if you want to unlock the gospel, you might read that and say, well, they're all just dumb fishermen. No, they actually have some of the highest caliber coming from the Galilean region, but lots of Talmudic, great Talmudic sages, but they just had a different idea. And some of the Pharisees living and sages living in Jerusalem had a slightly different idea and said, oh, their idea is no good. But you can't take that at face value. You have to investigate these things to realize that they just said that, well, if your study overcomes your deeds and you're a bad student of Torah. And the other guy said, no, no, no. If your deeds overcome your study, you're a bad student of Torah. It's two different ideas. You see what I'm getting at? So it's yeah. important for us to know that where we come from is AA plus standard, PhD student material in the Galilean region. In fact, the Galilean region is a light of Torah in a dark Hellenistic world. It's like the little town of, um, it, it almost couldn't be found. It's so small, Nazareth. But it is a, like a tiny little village where the purest Jews lived in a Greco-Roman like desk pit, mm. essentially. <laughs> so that's how righteous our guys were, but they were deeds over study. Doesn't mean you shouldn't study, but that's kind of the caliber we're looking at. And that's the, that's the premise of the discussion when the Pharisees come to criticize Yeshua, it's because of a slightly differing idea, not because he was against oral Torah, or any of those other things. It was, they were like, well, your way of doing Torah in our Jewish framework is not as superior as our idea because we come from Jerusalem. Mm. Kind of a bit of a pedigree versus, yeah, you know. So that's the condensed version. Um, so what we have to realize is that when we look at the discussions around Pharisees, Sadducees, Hasidism in the New Testament, there's a baseline orthodoxy, just like we have today. And the baseline orthodoxy is temple worship, following Torah, dietary laws, all the things we see in the New Testament. Yeah. And the outgrowths, for instance, the Pharisees had a specific outgrowth, the Essenes had a specific outgrowth mm. off that baseline. 
we are attached to that baseline, which means we follow Talmud, Mishnah, all those kinds of things. But our outgrowth is the Hasidic concepts of God as our father. Jewish mysticism is expressed here, miracles, signs and wonders by life, the hand of God. Life after yeah. death, which is the life, the resurrection of the dead, exactly. Um, worshipping in a synagogue. You can't worship in a synagogue unless you were part of the Pharisee circle. You couldn't break bread with them, which we know Yeshua did. Mm. Whether they had disagreements or not is by the by. You couldn't even enter their house if you went on their level. Yeah. So Yeshua is on the level and we should be heading to that level. Did you have a question? The back? Did you put your hand up as a question? No, okay. I thought I saw what you did. Okay. Um, so David Fleeser, quickly, just I'll close on this. I'm not pushing out. I'm just you know, seeing um, what we're up to. Mm -hmm. So the idea of being uh, righteous in poverty, you know, blessed are the meek, um, being pious, living a simplistic material life to pursue closeness, personal relationship with God is a hallmark of the New Testament and the Hasidic or pious movement of the day. And David Flusser, a renowned German scholar, says that Jesus worked in that socioeconomic circle. So if we were to visit Jesus back in his day, that's the kind of person and his personal lens you would encounter is of that idea of the poor, humble, but learned in Torah, but great in deeds and morality. Yes, at the back. Sorry, Ghost DC. Thank you. Uh, Ryan. Are yeah. you able to give us some rabbis' names who are in this um, Hasidic group of rabbis? Yes. So I'll give you some from the Second Temple period who were considered to be Hasidic. Let me find. I think what, uh, what Ryan and I might do, and maybe Daniel, is we might do a, a podcast on this and just give you all the additional background information because... Um, there's a lot that we've got here, and uh, there's, it's good background information, but um, we've run out of time. <laughs> and so. also, we'll have to discuss how that looks like for us Gentiles as well. Yeah, yeah we yeah, haven't exactly. even begun. So um, if I give you the name, one would be Honey the Circle Drawer, H-O-N-I the Circle Drawer. Um, there are a few other ones, but I can't... I might have to give them to you online, but there is two that come from the Galilean region and two that come outside for Yeshua's time. But I'll, I'll make sure that we post, update those online, sorry, yeah. just for the sake of time. But yeah. yes, Honey the Circle Drawer is one very famous example. Um, and there is the book, Ryan. Ryan. There is the book this of Honey the Circle, yeah, the, the Circle Drawer. No, that's... Yeah. Oh, so what was he called? Sorry, I thought you said what book. Why, okay, so... Uh, that, that's a sidetrack question. Yeah, <laughs> it was based on a miraculous story, but they're found in these books. Yeah. I'm going to send a photo of yeah, it on we'll, the messenger. We'll, we'll actually send those out. I just wanted to... Um, sorry, Ryan. So we're moving on now? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I think there's... Um, yes. There's, uh, there's a lot of good information that will round up all of this. Sorry, sorry, Ron, I know you did a lot of work. No, we didn't, we only, but, but we, we, we just wanted to, just wanted to express the, the fact that we are very close to Hasidic Judaism, but we're not part of that strictness that you see on some of the um, shows, you know, the ultra Orthodox stuff where, um, it's almost like a cult you you know you can bring it to that level of cultishness and we that's not where we want to go nowhere near it but we want to encapsulate that Hasidic thing that Ryan was talking about we have a relationship with Hashem the father through Yeshua not through anything else uh, we do the works of Torah because of our love that's what we we've been not saved through works but we've been saved to do the works and so that's why we want to do the works that's got to be our motivation i actually wanted to um, let daniel close on um, this because it sort of summarizes everything that uh, if judith if you can put daniel up on the screen that'd be good thanks it sort of summarizes the the whole concept and then we can unpack it in ongoing bait midrashes as to how some of these things will be played out within our kahila there's a lot there that we want to touch on. 
a lot of vision that we want to sow on this, but um, uh, Daniel uh, has actually summarized it pretty well. Go ahead, Daniel. Cool. Um, yeah, so I suppose the bit I'm looking at is more about uh, the ethical outworking of uh, in, in our community as unity um, of what all this looks like. So um, I'm going to start with a quote from Le Bab Charebi. Um, and he once said that love is the transcendence of the soul over the body. So just keep that in mind as I go along and that will make a bit more sense. So basically our desire for Derek Hamashiach is that um, we become known as a community of love, first and foremost, and that we shine the light of Yeshua, our Messiah, to everyone around us. To do this, we are to be deliberate in our actions and words. So um, one of the verses that sort of came to mind for me was Proverbs 18.21, where it talks about how there's power of life and death in the, in the words we use. Um, and we want to show the way of Messiah as the way of life. So this means that um, in, we have to really be mindful in our relationships. I sort of am um, viewing relationships like an instrument that requires constant practice to get better. Um, when you're learning an instrument like percussions or drums, it's easy just to sort of hit it to make noise um, without really learning how to control, to have rhythm, to make music. Um, so that's the sort of idea in 1 Corinthians 13, um, where we're reminded to um, that if we, if we study Torah and practice Torah, it doesn't really matter. It's not anything if we don't have love. It's just noise. Um, and our relationships are much the same as that, where it's often easier for us to speak out quickly in anger, hatred, or sometimes in a sense of self-righteousness, which I think it can be the most tempting for us as a community when we feel like we know something that someone else doesn't. Um, but it's a lot easier for us, and I mean all of us, including myself, to do that instead of speaking in patience and love and grace and understanding. Um, so there was definitely an art of mindfulness in speaking in love and avoiding hate. Um, I know people are aware of what mindfulness is. It's sort of come out of modern psych movement, psychology, but basically being centered and present where you are and being aware of what you are doing while you're doing it. So mindfulness conversation would be actually being aware of what's in your mind and then choosing to feel throughout love from hate and only speaking well. So it's a, it's a practice and you get better at it as you go. Um, and it's something that I sort of have to practice myself. <laughs> so I suppose um, with all that in mind, um, how does that apply to us as a killer? I'm seeing this more of a statement of commitment and that's commitment from us as smash, as leaders um, and as deacons. Um, it's for us to continue to develop our ability to speak in love rather than anger, hate or self-righteousness. And then it's invitation for you to follow us on this development. Um, I should make it clear, this doesn't mean that we don't speak truth. Um, if something is true, we have a, an obligation, more than an obligation, we have a mandate to speak it, but it's how it's said, why it's said, and what the outcome of truth being said is. So I suppose our dream for this community is, um, I think it was said before, maybe Kay said it, is to be a bridge. So if we're a bridge between all Gentiles searching for the Torah and the Jewish people who are the keepers of the, of the Torah, it's important that we don't create any barriers on this bridge. So the words we use, the tone we use, um, and whether or not we keep Torah to the extent that we should, and where we flaunt the fact that we know different to someone else. Um, and it's the creating a safe space. So that bridge and then that safe space that anyone can walk into our healer and find Torah without being, um, not feeling that they will be respected or understood, whether that be a person from a Christian background, a person from a Jewish background, an atheist, or even um, someone who has a Muslim or Hindu background. 
anyone should be able to work, walk into our space, feel love, understand that we are speaking truth and Torah without being filled less of. Um, and I suppose that's where something that we all wanted to develop this year. Um, and I suppose it's an invitation for you guys to join us as we sort of, yeah, uh, figure out how to, to speak truth in love rather than hatred or self righteousness Thank you, Daniel. Excellent. Thank you, Daniel. That's a good okay. summary of where we want to head to as a Kahila. Yeah. And as I said, in the next few weeks and months, we'll be unpacking individual bits uh, yeah. that we've put together for today yes. <laughs> and, uh, and sharing that, how, how we're going to do that as, mm. as a Kahila, right? Yes. Um, Yes and amen to everything that has been said so far. And uh, so the unpacking of this will come down right to the very nitty gritty, which I've been given the responsibility to share, obviously not today, maybe not even next week, but it's going to be the practical things of, do we hug, do we kiss, do we hand, uh, shake hands? We really need to know how are we going to interact with one another because it is our responsibility to model this what what uh, safe space that Daniel spoke to? Did everyone hear what I was just saying, or is that just something in the background? Is that you can't they can't see it all now? Here we go. <laughs> Hi everyone. I hope you heard what I said. Apologies, I was sitting down in the audio, in the congregation there. I just yeah. want to say that. Um, it, we sort of were very ambitious and we thought, oh, we'll cover it all in one week. Now it's going to be two weeks and it may even be three weeks. It, it, it'll, be bits, it'll be bits and pieces. We're not going to do everything yeah. in, in one lot again. Mm. But just to repeat what I have already said, we're going to take it right to the detail of how do we interact with one another and to those, how do we welcome people in? What is our responsibility? What is our mode of communication that creates a safe space for those? What consent is there in a handshake or a hug? And, and we're going to unpack all of that because we need to know how to behave with one another with respect and with love. Mm. 